Okay, let's get started. Okay, we have a question from someone. Um, lifestyle evangelism. So it depends on when the session was. Let me just check. Um, you know, you would have got a schedule. Okay, John Paul, fine. Um, so, so, okay, I hope that answers the question. Okay, right. Okay, let's, why don't we just pray and get started? Okay. Um, Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this uh, session. Um, Lord, I just want to thank you for each and every person who is connected. And um, I just pray, God, um, Lord, for their um, the season that they are in, Lord, and the, uh, Lord, in their spiritual journey with you, uh, in their walk with you. Father God, I pray that um, this course will be a blessing to them. I pray, God, that you will lead us um, to discover many truth, O oh God, that you've uh, kept for us, Father God. And Holy Spirit, I will ask that you would reveal these so that we might um, Lord, receive it and walk in it, O oh God. And uh, we commit uh, this time into your mighty hands. And we pray that you would speak to us and you would write your word upon our hearts as only you can. We just want to thank you. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' matchless name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, if you have your notes, um, you know, the notes for the Holy Spirit class, it's in the classwork section, um, which, um, which is there uh, in the, um, uh, you know, if you've joined in, uh, if you've connected through the phone or through your uh, um a laptop, you'll notice it in the classwork section. You can download that. It's a PDF. Uh, you can refer to that. So we're going to be looking uh, at that and then going through those notes, right? So let me uh, just present um, that note just to give you an overview of uh, what the course is about. And um, yeah, um, I hope you can see uh, my screen. Okay, it's just coming up. Right, okay. So, um, oops. Okay. So, Holy Spirit, uh, we will start by. Uh, so, this course is about the person uh, and the ministry uh, and the working of the Holy Spirit, the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. So, we're going to be looking at several scriptures. So, it'll help if you keep your Bible um, handy. Right. So, we're going to be starting by looking at the Trinity. Um, uh, and we're going to look at the person of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, and the work of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus, in the book of Acts, uh, in church history, uh, towards a sinner, in a, in a believer's life. Sorry. Um, and, uh, and then we also go down to um, the gifts, right? The baptism. The anointing of the Holy Spirit, um, baptism in the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to be looking at each of these, uh, uh, or you know, we're going to have an overview of each of these gifts, how these gifts function, and so on. And then we're going to look at uh, the foundation for release of these gifts, ministering in these gifts, and and so on. Then we're going to look at uh, the anointing. Uh, what is it? Uh, what is what is called the anointing and and uh, and also the ministry gifts uh, and how the anointing of uh, Holy Spirit uh, functions uh, on specifically these ministry gifts and so on. And yeah, and then we'll finish with uh, the names of the Holy Spirit and symbols of the Holy Spirit. So it's quite uh, interesting, quite exciting. Um, so this is how the grading is. Uh, we will have four quizzes uh, during the course of uh, this semester. And typically, this will be at the end of every month, so end of August, September, October, and November. And um, this will be uh, graded. So 25% of each of um, uh, the scores will be taken, and uh, it will be added to the final score. Right? And uh, you know, this is the uh, table for the grades. Um, there's some recommended reading. Actually, some of these are already there in your um, you know, textbook. Uh, we'll be adding it to your textbook section. Um, okay, so yeah, 
so that's uh, that's just an overview of how what we're going to do and how we're going to uh, do the course. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so Lubega um, class code for your. Uh, I think you're talking about uh, lifestyle evangelism. Um, so you basically you need to sign in first and then you will get the class just like how you did for this course. And then you can have to click on the link in order to get into. So we'll um, probably one of our students will help out. Uh, do you all have the uh, WhatsApp group? Are you all part of a WhatsApp group? Has it not been not started yet? OK. OK, so um, yeah. So we'll 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 try and sort that out after the class, right? You can get in touch with uh, maybe in some of us here, or or you can write to uh, admin at Bible College, apcbiblecollege dot org, and uh, we'll get that sorted. Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, move on. Uh, okay, first of all, uh, we need to understand uh, you know something about uh, about the way God is um, easier said than done. The the character, the very the nature of God, the fact that He is a, a triune God. Right? What makes God God is the fact that He is uh, omnipresent, which means He's present everywhere. He is uh, all knowing or omniscient, and He is also all powerful or omni omnipotent. Right. So that's what makes him uh, God. That's what makes God God. And uh, when we look at scripture, we see God being presented to us as a triune God. That he is uh, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, just like how we, when you look at the Bible, you see that uh, the Bible doesn't really explain and, uh, and, uh, and say, okay, build up a case for God. It just starts by saying, you know, Genesis 1 1 in the beginning God okay so in the beginning God this is it okay God is in other words God is that God created and this is how he created that's how it starts so we see God being presented as a triune God that he's the father the son and the Holy Spirit so it's one God existing in three persons but in essence he is one God so it's not, uh, he's not three different gods, like some of the other worldviews are. He's not three different gods, but he is one God, uh, one in essence, but existing as three persons. Now, as much as we try to explain Trinity, you know, we can make it very simple and very simplistic ways. People have tried to explain it and saying, oh, it's like water, ice, and, and steam. And, but, you know, everything falls short of really explaining, right, uh, to the fullest extent, uh, the Trinity. Okay. Uh, because the thing is that as much as we try to explain and uh, you know, dive in and, and see uh, the possibilities of how he is and who he, uh, he is as a as a triune God. Um, at the end of the day, you know, the whole aspect of God being a triune God is a mystery for us. Okay, because we are finite beings. We are finite beings. Now we cannot be omnipresent we can't be present in you know uh, except in one place right? we can't be present in multiple places at the same time so for us the aspect of god being omnipresent itself is something that we cannot wrap our minds around yes or no yeah the fact that god is speaking to me right now and the fact that god could be speaking to you know uh, 20 24 of you at the same time having a parallel conversation itself is something that I cannot wrap my mind around, right? So just imagine the entire, you know, the body of Christ, the global body of Christ, that God is who he is to them, helping them, revealing things uh, to each and every person. Right? So that's who he is, right? He is omnipresent and he's all-knowing, infinite wisdom and so on. So uh, at the end of the day, we know that this whole thing of God being a triune God is a mystery and we will have eternity to find out 
Okay, we're going to spend eternity finding out more and more about this triune God. So um, I'm not going to go into explaining uh, Trinity, but we're going to look at Scripture and several places in Scripture where we see these, this triune God, where we see where Scripture gives us the picture that, hey, this, this uh, you know, uh, and gives us... Um, a picture of the triune God, uh, right? So we're going to look at several ver verses. Okay. Uh, first off, the word Trinity is not there in Scripture. Okay. So um, it's a theological construct in the in the sense that it's a word which people use or theologians use to explain this uh, triune God. So the word Trinity is not there. So many, you know, many people have this. Uh, you know, this argument or this challenge, you know, the word Trinity is not there. How can you say, you know, God is Trinity? Trinity is not there in the Bible. Yes, it is definitely not there. It's just a word to explain, like, the character, the nature of God, right? Okay, so let's look at uh, some scriptures uh, which give us the picture of the triune God. Okay, uh, when we look at creation itself, okay, if you have your notes, you can just follow in your notes. And that'll be great. So when you look at uh, creation itself, Genesis chapter 1, the verses that we just read, um, Genesis 1 verses 2 and 3. So it um, talks about, let me just put the verse here. Okay, it talks about uh, the fact that earth was without form and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Um, uh, Spirit of God, obviously, the Holy Spirit. And verse 3 says, then, And then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. So it's referring to, so two different words are used there to refer to you know, the Spirit of God and uh, to refer to and God said, right, we see, um, uh, uh, let me just uh, read out those uh, words in the beginning, God. So we see um, Elohim as, uh, as the word which is used there to refer to uh, the God the Father, Elohim created. And then when we uh, look at the word, uh, the spirit, we see that uh, Ruach which means breath. So Ruach, um, the Spirit of God was over uh, the waters. Right? So we, we see this. Um, so in creation, we see both um, the Father, Elohim, and we see um, the Holy Spirit uh, moving on the face of the waters. Okay, so we see a parallel of that in um, Hebrews 1. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go to Hebrews 1, and uh, let's look at a few verses here. Okay, Hebrews 1 it says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Okay, so, uh, so in Genesis, the verses that we read, verses 2 and 3, we see the we see God being present there. We see the Holy Spirit uh, brooding over the waters or hovering over the waters. And here, Hebrews, referring to that account, um, the writer of Hebrews says that, uh, you know, uh, that through whom also he made the worlds, that uh, uh, referring to the Lord Jesus, the Son, that uh, God has spoken to us by his Son, and through the Son he made the worlds who bring uh, let's read verse 3 hebrews 1 who being the uh, the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high and so on okay and if you look at chapter 2 and uh, and verse verses 3 and 4 uh, maybe verses 2 onwards. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God also bearing witness both with signs 
and wonders with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So we see the Father being mentioned there. We see, uh, because he's the one who has, who at various times and spoke uh, and various ways spoken times fast, uh, times past to um, uh, to the fathers by the prophets. That's what verse one says. And then we look at the worlds being created by the Son. Uh, and then we, when we look at chapter two and verses verse four, talks about how God bore witness with signs and miracles and wonders um, by the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So we see, you know, uh, the three persons of the triune God, of the Godhead uh, being mentioned here, right, uh, right there when it comes to creation. Um, okay, let's move on. Let's move on and uh, look at another verse. Uh, which, so these are, you know, different pictures that we see uh, right there in, uh, in scripture, which talks to us about the triune God. And it's important for us to understand that, acknowledge that hey, this is how God is presented right through Scripture, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And just like how Scripture assumes that, uh, you know, in, in the beginning, God, uh, the same way, the writer of Scripture, you know, there's no, there's no confusion right in their minds. Uh, this is how God existed, and this is how God worked or exists and he works, right? So let's look at another scripture. We go to um, the Gospel of Luke, and here we read about the the birth and um, uh, some verses referring to that. Okay, so Luke chapter 1, and um, let's look at verse 30 onwards. Okay, then the angel said to her, so this is the angel, um, which has come with the news, of what's going to happen, Angel Gabriel, and said to her, referring to Mary, the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be? Since I do not know a man. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Okay. Um, verse 37, for with God, nothing will be impossible. So he, again, we uh, we see God being mentioned that uh, will bring forth a son. So the Lord Jesus being mentioned and how it's the power of the highest, the Holy Spirit, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit uh, and the power of the Holy Spirit, which causes this conception and uh, which causes this miraculous work. Okay, so in the birth, uh, referring this, uh, when we look at the scriptures referring to the birth of the Lord Jesus, we see the picture of uh, Trinity. Okay, um, another scripture is in Matthew chapter three. Okay, we're going to look at several verses, and uh, these. Uh, give us the picture of the triune God. Yeah, so uh, we're going to look at Matt, Matthew chapter three, and this is, you know, this is this is very dramatic, and this is um, this is a, one of my favorite verses. Okay, you just imagine the scene, uh, Matthew three and verse um, uh, the whole uh, chapter. Is, is about John the Baptist coming and he's preaching repentance and he's uh, um, and he's baptizing people and very exciting, right? So he's talking about the Lord Jesus. He's saying, you know, uh, 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 you know, I I baptize you with water, but there is one who is coming after me, and whose sandal straps I'm not worthy to care, you know, whose saddles I'm not worthy to carry. And he will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And there comes the Lord Jesus. And they have this conversation. And uh, John the Baptist uh, baptizes the Lord Jesus. So can you just picture the scene, you know, just being there and experiencing the whole, you know, this whole thing unfolding before our eyes. Must have been very exciting. Must have been, you know, full, very dramatic and, and, and wonderful to see all that. And 
verse 16 okay let's read from verse verse 13 onwards well, um, then jesus came from galilee to john at the jordan to be baptized by him and john tried to prevent him saying i need to be baptized by you and are you coming to me uh, but jesus answered and said to him permit it to be so now for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness then he allowed him um, look at verse 16 when he had been baptized Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. Verse 17, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Okay, Matthew 3, um, 16 and 17. So, so he comes out out of the water the heavens were opened he sees the holy spirit the spirit of god descending upon him and alighting upon him like a dove and there's the voice which is from heaven obviously the voice of the father because this is what he hears this is my beloved son in whom i am well please so the son is there there's a voice of the Father, and we see the Holy Spirit alighting upon the Son, like descending and alighting upon the Son, like a dove. Uh, a wonderful picture of the triune God. You know, different roles, different functions, but one God, uh, one in essence, and three in persons. Okay, um, let's move on. Let's look at um, another another scripture which is uh, right at the end of uh, the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 28, and uh, let's look at verses uh, 18 onwards. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So the Lord Jesus, uh, in commissioning the disciples, and right, commissioning his followers, he is, is sending them out. He's giving them a very important instruction. He's saying, go make disciples of all the nations all the people groups, the ethne, go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the Lord Jesus saying, you know, this is how you baptize them. You baptize them, and, and we know that baptism is a symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection. It's symbolic. Um, we read about it in Romans chapter 6 as well. So, uh, and... Um, you know, a choice is made. There's a the change, internal change. It refers to the internal change. It's an external act, but refers to the internal change. And the Lord is saying, this is how you will baptize. And you will baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, a beautiful picture again of the triune God. Okay. Uh, is it exciting? Yeah. So, you know, many times we we have in our minds right people ask you know how can god be triune how can uh, maybe you know you're talking about three gods and it's not one god and, and so on but so in the in the mind or in the heart of the lord jesus the same thing you know he came to reveal the father he came to um, instruct us uh, about god's heart right we see many parables the parable of the lost coin the lost son the lost sheep he came to show us the Father's heart. So you look at Jesus, you know uh, who God is, you understand who God is. And, and this is he who says, you know, you go baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right? So you see that three are one, uh, and, uh, and the Lord Jesus very clearly just declaring, uh, this is how you will baptize. Okay. Um, let's look at uh, another scripture. Uh, in the plan of redemption. Okay. So um, 
humanity, fallen humanity in God's plan of redeeming fallen humanity, redeeming people from sin. Okay, we we look at again the the Trinity. Let's look at Hebrews nine. Okay, Hebrews chapter nine and uh, verse fourteen. Right, Hebrews nine and verse fourteen. Um, maybe uh, I'll read from. Uh, verse 13 for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh he's talking about the shadow talking about the time till the, uh, the you know till the cross how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Okay, uh, and it goes on to say, he's the mediator for this reason. Let's read verse 14 again. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So we see, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ being mentioned there, his blood was shed and talks about what made that possible through the eternal spirit. He offered himself through the work of the spirit. He offered himself and the Holy Spirit was the, was the power of God in resurrecting uh, the Lord Jesus from the dead. We read about that in the episodes as well. And through uh, the Holy Spirit offered himself without spot to God. Again, in the plan of redemption, we see um, the, the the Trinity, right? We see the triune God being mentioned there, at work there, um, each one doing different things, right? And uh, we see that. Okay, in the resurrection, okay, Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. Romans 8 and uh, verse 11. Maybe someone, someone can read Romans 8, verse 11, and another person can read uh, after that Romans 6 and verse 4 also. Um, yeah, anyone, Romans, I'll just, uh, Romans 8, 11. Romans 8, 11. Yep. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus, Christ Jesus from the dead, will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Yeah. So uh, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Again, we see uh, it, it's about talking about the resurrection and we see the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit being mentioned here. Okay. Uh, anyone Romans 6 and verse 4? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that Jesus, that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Yeah. Um, so here uh, there's no reference to the Holy Spirit, but we see the, the Son and the Father. And when we read uh, Romans 8 and verse 11, we see um, the Spirit, um, the Father, and Christ being mentioned there, so we see in the uh, in the resurrection, right, uh, the, the triune God uh, being mentioned there. Okay, um, uh, okay, few more few more scriptures, and then uh, we'll you know we'll if there are any questions, we'll take up. Okay, so we see that. Okay, the the next one we see is in Acts chapter seven. Now this refers to Stephen, the first uh, martyr for the sake of uh, for the sake of his faith. Uh, Acts chapter seven. Okay, so let's look at Acts chapter seven and verses. Um, um, you know, uh, Acts chapter seven. We see that uh, uh, Stephen actually gives a wonderful sermon. Uh, gives a wonderful message, uh, starting from. Uh, starting from Abraham, and he goes on, uh, you know, right through history, and he talks about uh, uh, the Lord Jesus and 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 the prophets whom the, the the fathers killed and so on. Now, 
Verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Okay. Um, and said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So any any uh, uh, you know doubts or any questions or any clarifications, uh, any any doubts about the deity of the Lord Jesus and also about the Trinity God. Again, you know we see more and more evidence here uh, about the Trinity God. Right? See, Stephen himself was full of the Holy Spirit, and then he sees heaven open, and then he sees the Father. And he sees the son standing at the right hand of the father. Okay, so we see uh, we see that in Stephen's uh, case where he was martyred, and we see this mentioned. Okay, so in heaven, okay, Revelation chapter five, Revelation five and verse six talks about the Lamb of God. It talks about the spirits. The seven spirits or the seven facets of the Spirit of God. And uh, these two verses talk about that. Okay, let me read Revelation 5, verse 6. And I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures. So it's referring to the throne where God sat and God sits. And in the midst of the elders to the Lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Okay, so so in the heavens, I also see the uh, the picture of uh, the triune. Okay, and several other scriptures that we can we can look at, um, which refer to the triune God. You know, uh, let's say if you look at John chapter fourteen and verse sixteen. Um, John 14 and verse 16. Um, so this is uh, John chapter 14, actually, whole, uh, 14, 15, and 16. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good place to go to where we read about the Holy Spirit, where Jesus actually teaches about the Holy Spirit. And he says, this is what uh, he, the Holy Spirit will do. You know, he, He's going to do this. He's going to teach you. He's going to... Uh, remind you and so on. So, uh, John chapter chapters fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen—a uh, great place to study about the work of the Holy Spirit um, and the Lord Jesus Himself teaching. Right. So, uh, if you look at uh, fourteen and verse fifteen, right, it says, "If you love me, keep my commandments." And then verse sixteen, and I will pray the Father, and He will give you another Helper, that He may abide with you forever. So who is this he that he's referring to? Who is this helper that he's referring to? Verse 17. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Okay, so... Um, Several other scriptures that are listed there in the notes, you can you can take a look at it. But then, uh, so this is what we see, right? This is what we see. So scripture, very unapologetically, very categorically um, declaring the, about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? And uh, in the in the chapters to come, we just want to see how the Holy Spirit is God, right? uh, and how He is a person. And so on. So, so any questions based on what we uh, looked at just now? Uh, any questions? You can go ahead and uh, you can either ask or you can put it on the chat, and uh, we'll try to look at that before uh, we proceed further. Any questions? Uh, Okay, so um, uh, here's another thing. Uh, what I will also do at the end of the class is uh, put up a, a Google Sheet and uh, put the link uh, for that 
sheet in the classwork section um, right below or right above the resource material section. So um, what you can do is uh, whatever questions that you might have, so each of you will have access uh, to it. So you, whatever questions that you might have about the subject of the Holy Spirit, Okay, now it could be about uh, the questions that you always had, right? How can a person who has a Holy Spirit, how can he sin? Or how can a Holy Spirit indwell a person who is sinful? You know, whatever questions that you might have had right through life. Okay, so you can just enter that. Okay, just enter that uh, and type in the question there. And, um, and hopefully by the end of this semester, we would have answered all those questions sufficiently, right? Uh, through the course material, through the, through the classes, cl the sessions in, uh, that we have, we would have answered those questions. And uh, we'll look at, we'll take a look at that sheet at the end of the class, uh, end of the semester, and we'll see if there are any unanswered questions and we will try and address that as well. Okay, so um, maybe the, uh, after 12, 12 o'clock, maybe by one o'clock you can, uh, India time, you can check that, uh, check your stream again, or uh, check the classwork section and uh, this sheet will be there. You can type in those questions. Okay, um, here's a question. Can you ex kindly explain Revelation 5 verse 6? Okay, the, the, the reason we quoted Revelation 5, 6 was to just for us to know that the, the Lamb of God, uh, who is the Lord Jesus, the Lamb who took away the sin of the world, um, you know, he is, and this is something that uh, John saw, right? It, it, the whole of Revelation is uh, uh, based on the encounter that John had with the Lord Jesus. That's how it starts. And, uh, uh, and the message for the church or for the you know, what is to come, uh, the Lord Jesus asks him to write down, right? So this is what he writes down. So Revelation 5, um, he he continues to write about what he saw, right? Uh, and this is what he saw, um, Revelation 5 and 6. He, he looked, and in the midst of the throne, there were four living creatures. And there were these, so several people are mentioned there, right? The living creatures, the elders. Then you see the lamb, the um, lamb. And then, which uh, having seven horns and seven eyes and seven spirits of God, and you know all that is mentioned. There. So, um, so this is what he, um, okay, this is what he saw, right? So, um, so he is just explaining what he saw. Okay, I hope that helps. Now, if your if your question is, okay, what is what are those seven horns? What are those seven eyes? And what are the seven spirits? Um, if you, I, I just want to request you to just hold on a little, uh, you know, uh, just put it on pause. We will address that. You know, we're going to be looking at how this Holy Spirit is a spirit of revelation, wisdom, and so on. So we're looking at the, we'll be looking at um, Isaiah chapter 11 and where it talks about the uh, seven characteristics or aspects of God. And seven being a number of completion. Okay, so, um, so we're going to be looking at that. Um, I hope that's uh, fine. Zalitoli, right? Yes, yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Um, and Rebecca has a question. How does the Holy Spirit work in human beings? Amazing ways we cannot function as believers without the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit uh, speaks to us. He's the one who gives us the confidence that we are sons and daughters of God. You know, we might wake up one morning and feel that, uh, hey, uh, I feel so disconnected from God. I feel I feel all weird, and uh, I feel I feel as if I'm not a believer. The Holy Spirit gives us the confirmation. He gives us the confidence because that is what we read uh, in Romans chapter eight. He actually confirms to us that we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. It is because of the Holy Spirit that we cry out, "Abba, Father." Uh, so that is just identity you know the identity that we have something that the holy spirit gives to us or reinforces that the holy spirit also teaches us the lord jesus says that he will he will teach you of things to come he will guide you into all truth the holy spirit convicts us of sin uh the holy spirit reveals scripture to us and so many other things um right so he is the one who uh, uh that he releases the gifts so that we can minister effectively and so on so we're going to be uh, looking at all that um in the classes to come 
okay how is the holy spirit the the spirit of truth okay so john 14 17 okay i'm just going to uh, copy all these questions and uh, you know we'll put that in that sheet also all right uh, just a minute please okay okay so um just a couple of questions okay uh, how is holy spirit the spirit of truth of, of course one of the um, uh, you know things that we see is that um, um, the lord jesus when he's talking about himself in you know in that same chapter um, uh, he says that he is the way the truth and the life so one of the characteristics of god is that uh, he is truth personified right uh, it's his very nature to uh, if you want truth you look at God, right? Uh, he is righteous. He is the very opposite of what unrighteousness is. And when we say that he is the spirit of truth, the Lord Jesus himself is saying that he is the spirit of um, a truth, uh, that is one of his uh, characteristics, or uh, that is his nature, uh, that he reveals truth, that he is truth itself. You know, that's his character, that's his nature. So, he will lead us into truth you know that gives us confidence that he will not lead us into error which is the opposite of truth uh, or he will not deceive us lead us into de deception but he is the spirit of truth if you look at that verse um, he says he will dwell with you he will be with you and um, and and you will know him and he will be with you and so on and if you when we read through um that verse uh, that chapter sorry uh, we see that holy spirit is the helper and he will teach you and he will cause you to remember rem uh, he will he will remind you bring to your remembrance all the things that the lord jesus has taught has spoken so uh, this is the work of um, Holy Spirit, you know, He's the Spirit of Truth. So we know that He will not lead us into error. He will teach us, and when we when we know that He will teach us what is the truth, He will not teach us something that is, um, you know, that is mixed with lies or uh, you know something that is uh, error. Okay. Uh, so Joash, I hope that helps. Um, another question is um, how can a sinning man still speak in tongues and move on the gifts and uh, you know romans 11 29 we looked at it first this morning in the mentoring session um we see that the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable okay so if you look at uh, the gift of tongues specifically uh, it's given so that uh, we will be edified personally you know, 1 Corinthians 14 talks about he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, builds up himself. There's a, you know, a spiritual edification happening. There's something that is built in the inner man. Uh, the gift of tongues also, you know, we speak the mysteries of God. Again, 1 Corinthians 14, you know, we, it talks about how we speak the mysteries of God, how the, the God, uh, God has put this in place or released that for believers so that we can speak the mysteries of God. So um, that... You know, so this is uh, a gift that he's given us so that we might be strong and overcome the things of the flesh, right? So that's a beautiful, as if he's, the, the gift of tongues is released to a person because he's reached a several, you know, a, a level of holiness. No, he is given to us and we might be struggling in different things, but he is given to us that we might be edified. The Spirit of God comes and dwells us that we might be edified. He wants us to become like Jesus. So that's a beautiful thing, that we're not struggling in several things, but the gift actually um, is to bring us out of that, right? to make us conform to the image of Jesus. He has come to do that. Right? He has come to teach us. He has come to lead us into truth. And one of the ways he does that is by releasing the gifts of tongues right? we're going to study about the gift of learn about the gift of tongues as well um so that's going to be exciting um okay uh, okay uh, i think um abu Bakr has lifted his hand you have a question abu Bakr. okay if you have a question you can put it in the chat um 
right? Abu Bakr. Okay, another question. What is the familiar spirit and how does it come into a believer's life? Okay, a familiar spirit is obviously uh, a spirit. It's, it's, um, it's, it's an evil spirit. And uh, we, we see that, um, uh, I, I'll share the reference a little later. But the familiar spirit actually is familiar with our ways, is familiar with, uh, you know, the ways of, uh, uh, you know, maybe our history and so on. And, and the work of the spirit is to actually uh, take us away from the destiny of God, right? Maybe create create some kind of uh, um, uh, confusion. Uh, so it's it's definitely uh, opposite of the of what God wants or what the Holy Spirit wants for us. So um, how, how does the Holy how does the family spirit come into the life of the believer? Uh, could be several ways. Maybe a person is deceived. Uh, maybe a person rebels against God. It could be several ways where we open up a doorway for the spirit to influence a person. Um, or, uh, you know, so it, um, so we'll, we'll talk about, um, you know, more about uh, the uh, spiritual realm and uh, um, the work of, uh, the, uh, you know, the work of the evil spirits and so on in another course. Um, but this is, um, this is what I can share. When does the Holy Spirit come in a believer, Aradhana? So, uh, you know, if you, when you, at the time, the scripture says, when we believe, when we receive the Lord Jesus into our lives, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. You know, he, at that moment, he comes and he indwells us, right? He's the one who teaches us and shows us that we are children of the Most High God. So he indwells us. So if you have received the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and uh, and you are born again, um, then you can be sure that uh, the Holy Spirit indwells you to teach you, to to show you, um, and also to confirm the things, right? That you are a child of God, right? Okay. How can a believer receive? Okay, that was your question, Abu Bakr. How can a believer receive the power of the Holy Spirit? Okay, so the power of the Holy Spirit, um, you know, the Lord Jesus, when he instructed his disciples, he, 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 you know, they were already following the Lord. Uh, he told them to wait for, for wait in Jerusalem. He said that, um, uh, wait in Jerusalem so that, um, you know, for you will have an encounter, you will have an experience. And we see that, um, uh, we see that in Acts chapter 1, where, uh, um, we see that um, uh, you, uh, sorry, Acts chapter 1 and verse verse 5, um, you have heard from me, for John, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Okay, Acts chapter 1, verse 5. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Okay, so so how does um, how can a believer receive by simply by asking and receiving, and uh, and that's how it, it's as simple as that. Right? That's how we see um, the believers in the Book of Acts. They pray, they were in prayer, and they receive. You know, the first instance that we see, the day of Pentecost, they were all in prayer, and the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they were infilled. Uh, or filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, how does indwelling of the Holy Spirit differ from the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Okay, we're going to take a lot of time uh, looking at that. Okay, that question, Elisha. So, um, uh, is, is there a difference? Uh, uh, let me just answer this. You know, is there a difference? Yes. Okay, and why is there a difference? Uh, very quickly, if you look at it, uh, one, the indwelling is for our personal edification is for our personal growth. The Holy Spirit comes to help us, uh, lead us out of sin into the truth. Uh, the anointing or the baptism is for uh, for for Him to flow out of us. Um, it does not mean that you know He will He will sort of deal with stuff in our lives, but it's to flow out of us like a river to touch lives, to touch uh, touch uh, others. You know that's what we see right in Acts one eight. You will receive power. You will be witnesses. 
and you will go and do these things. You will be witnesses in all these places. So empowering us to be witnesses, so that's the um, work or that's the least objective of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Can a believer have the Holy Spirit and the familiar spirit? Okay, uh, Nicholson, and once we receive the Holy Spirit, is it possible that he might leave because of sin? Okay, uh, I think we are actually you know, progressing further uh, into what we are going to be looking at, and it's 9.53. What we'll do is we'll take a break, and then we'll come back, and uh, we'll look at these uh, uh, questions as well. Okay, so you can... Um, Take a break, a quick 10 minute break, and then we'll come back. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor.